This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. So a while back, I got into a little bit of Twitter trouble. I took a stance that was slightly more controversial than I anticipated, and while the ensuing discussion was by and large respectful and informative, by the standards of music theory Twitter, things got kinda dramatic. So what's the story? Well, it all began when I tweeted, why do we still teach augmented sixth chords as anything other than a historical subset of tritone substitutions? There were some folks who strongly agreed with me, others who even more strongly disagreed, and of course, there was also a pretty large group of people who had had no idea what I was talking about, so if that's you, don't worry, I'm gonna break it down. Let's say you have a phrase that ends with a 5 chord resolving to the 1. Simple enough, right? Now let's say that in order to really drive that resolution home, you want to do something special to set up the 5 chord. And finally, let's say you're a classical composer concerned with the principles of common practice voice leading. That sounds relatable, right? We all know what that's like. Now, with all that in mind, how are we going to make this work? Well, for starters, this isn't a very classical voicing of the 5 chord, is it? Let's spread those notes out a bit. Yeah, that's better. Alright, so a pretty important thing to know about classical part writing is that it's often less about the specific chords we're playing and more about how the individual notes move between those chords. We call this horizontal harmony, where you're basically writing a bunch of different melodies that happen to fit together to create a progression. So instead of looking for a chord that sets up the five, what we really want to be doing is taking each of our target notes and finding the best note to put in front of it. We've got four of these to find, so let's start with my favorite voice, the bass. Here we have it playing the root of the five chord, which is pretty important, so we've got to set it up just just right, and generally speaking, the best way to approach a note is by half-step, so since we're trying to get to B, let's step down from C. Perfect, let's move on to the tenor. It's also playing the root, so you might think we could just do the same thing again, but sadly we can't because it creates what's called parallel octaves. You see, according to the rules of common practice, if you have two voices an octave apart on one chord, they can't still be an octave apart on the next chord. Or, well, they can if they both sit still, but if they're moving, they have to move differently. Why? Well, again, the goal of part writing is to make a bunch of independent melodies, but when you have two lines moving together in such a consonant interval, you kind of lose that independence. They blend together into a single sound, which is totally fine and even potentially desirable in most styles of music, but in classical the rules say it's bad, and who are we to argue with the rules? So okay, we can't have our tenor approach from above, but that's easy, we'll just use the note a half step below our target instead. Nice. Next we'll skip up to the soprano, which is even easier. It's singing the third of the chord, and there's nothing stopping us from approaching that from above, so we'll just add that in and… Great. And finally the alto, which… Uh-oh. So the alto here is playing the fifth of the chord, which presents a bit of a problem. You see, much like we're not allowed to have parallel octaves, we're also not allowed to have parallel fifths. The perfect fifth isn't quite as consonant as the octave, but it's still stable enough that we lose our melodic independence if we move around with it, so that's not allowed. But since we're already approaching the root of our target chord from above and below, that leaves our fifth with no good options. But honestly, that's okay. It's the least important note in the chord, so we'll just approach it from a whole step below instead, giving us this. Now that we have our notes, what chord did we actually make? Well, if we assume the bass is the root, then we've got some major thirds here and here, and an augmented sixth here, which is why this is called an augmented sixth chord. Specifically, this is the Italian sixth. There's a couple different flavors based largely on how we solve the problem of approaching the fifth. The French sixth, for example, doesn't bother approaching it at all. It just starts on the target note and holds it through the resolution. The German sixth, meanwhile, says screw it, let's just do a parallel fifth. They're all doing basically the same thing, it's just there's this one little sticking point that each of them handles differently. So that's augmented sixth, but there's one last thing to note here before we move on. In modern equal-tempered tuning, which was already pretty common for the majority of the common practice era, the augmented sixth interval is just another name for the minor seventh. There are good theoretical reasons for using one name or the other, but when you play them, they sound exactly the same, which means our augmented sixth chords all have a major third and a minor seventh, making them, in effect, dominant seventh chords resolving down a half step. They they weren't necessarily viewed that way at the time, but the only way to tell by ear whether a chord is a dominant seventh or an augmented sixth is to look at the surrounding context. Keep that in mind, it's gonna come up again later. Okay, so now let's jump back to the beginning. We're trying to set up a five chord so we can do a big resolution to one again, but this time, instead of being a classical composer, let's be a jazz arranger. Now what do we do? Well, jazz tends towards the vertical harmony side of things. It's more about whole chords, so which chord sets up our five best? I mean, we could always use the two, but let's get a bit more adventurous. Let's use a 
secondary dominant. This is, in effect, a strongly directional chord that points us somewhere other than the root, and the easiest way to find one is just to look at the scale your target chord is based on and borrow its 5. That sounds a bit more confusing than it is, so let's try an example. We're in E major, so our 5 chord is B7, which points us back to E. If we want to point to B then, we can just sneak on over to B major, where the 5 chord is F sharp 7, and steal that for our original key. There's only one dominant 7 chord per key, so even though we're not really in B major, F sharp 7 still points to that B root, letting us get a moment of resolution on our 5 chord before it fully resolves back to the real 1. But we can take things further. There's two notes in F sharp 7 that are doing most of the heavy lifting. The A sharp, which goes up a half step to B, and the E, which goes down a half step to D sharp. Together, these two notes are what really creates the resolution, and even better, they're a tritone apart, which is a really unstable interval. It really wants to collapse. But the tritone is more than just unstable. It's also symmetrical. A sharp up to E is a tritone, and so is E up to A sharp. This means that each tritone has a mirror image, a second form that sounds exactly the same, but upside down. So in a sense, there's really only six unique tritones, but there's 12 unique dominant sevenths, each of which needs a tritone, which means they have to share. In the case of F sharp seven, its tritone, A sharp to E, is shared with C7. Or, well, C7 calls the A sharp a B flat, but again, different names, same sound. So if F sharp seven's tritone is what's driving the resolution to B, and C7 has the same tritone, can C7 also resolve to B? Yep. This is what's called a tritone substitution. I think technically the name comes from the fact that the roots of the two dominant chords are a tritone apart, but I like to think of it as just substituting based on a shared tritone. That feels neater to me. Anyway, hopefully now you can see why I'd compare these two things. We took two different routes, but in both cases we wound up with more or less a dominant seventh chord resolving down a half step. But are they actually the same thing? Well, honestly, I definitely overstated my case in the original Twitter thread. It was off the cuff, I was frustrated, and since it was just Twitter I didn't give it the care and consideration I'd give to an actual script. That's part of why I've waited almost a year to make a video about it. I wanted to give myself time to reflect and make sure my take was valid, accurate, and fair. And I do think my critics in that thread made a lot of good points. Like Adam Neely mentioned that while the notes are the same, the augmented sixth chord has some additional voice leading concerns that the tritone sub doesn't. A jazz piano player could just take a tritone sub and slide it down a half step to resolve, but that creates all sorts of parallelism, so you'd never see a classical composer do that with an augmented sixth. And that's totally true, but honestly, I think that's less a difference between the augmented sixth and the tritone sub, and more a difference between common practice and jazz. Common practice is full of voice leading rules, that's its whole thing, but in most cases that doesn't actually change the names we use for the chords, so I'm not sure why it should here. Some other common arguments were that the different derivations justified the separation, or that just calling it a sharp six instead of a flat seven made it a completely new thing, and and this I don't really buy. I'm a firm believer in the idea that analysis should reflect the listener's experience, and when you hear an augmented sixth chord, it doesn't really matter how it's notated or what the composer was thinking when they wrote it. What matters is that it resolves effectively, and either analysis does a perfectly good job explaining why. That said, I think this is a point on which reasonable people can disagree. If you put more stock in compositional intent, then this argument might be more compelling to you, and that's totally fine. It just doesn't do much for me. Moving on, a couple people also pointed me to a really good article by Dr. Nicole Biamonti that breaks down some of the differences in practical use between the augmented sixth and the tritone substitution. I'll put a link in the description, and if you want to know more, I highly recommend reading it, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing here because honestly, I agree with Dr. Biamonti's conclusions. There are good theoretical reasons to view these two devices as different, but there's a nuance of my original post that I think got lost in the ensuing chaos. I didn't ask why we don't view them the same, I asked why we don't teach them that way. This isn't really an argument about music theory at all, it's about pedagogy or teaching practice practices, and on that front, I think I have a very strong case. Basically, music theory has a bit of an image problem. To a lot of musicians, our whole field comes across as artificially complex. If you don't believe me, take a look at the comments section on basically any video I've ever made. And this reputation isn't entirely unearned. Theory has a tendency to sort of fold in on itself, with new ideas requiring more and more context and background in order to be meaningfully understood. That's not really our fault, it's just the nature of the beast, but there's some things we can do to help mitigate that conceptual sprawl and one of the best tools in our arsenal is analogies. You see, the human brain is an association machine, which makes it way easier to learn something if it looks like something else that you already know. Like earlier in the video when I mentioned parallel fifths, I compared them to parallel octaves. That way I didn't have to spend a bunch of time re-explaining why it wasn't allowed, you already understood that, so all I had to do was get you to translate it into a new context. Analogies let us build bridges, connecting distant parts of the theoretical landscape and creating larger, more coherent, and more easily understood 
structures. It also leads to new insights because logic from one model can shed light on the other. And there's another advantage. Analogies help students focus on the parts that matter. If you present augmented six as a brand new thing, then the focus is going to be on how that thing works in a fairly broad sense. But if you present them as like tritone subs, but different, then the focus becomes all about those differences. Students remember the details because they don't have to dedicate as much cognitive space to relearning the basic structure. And this, I think, is the point that really sells it for me. You see, when I wrote my original tweet, I was frustrated because in my video on the Andalusian cadence, I called something a tritone substitution and got hundreds of comments from people telling me I was wrong because it was actually an augmented sixth. Not a rigorously collected sample, I know, but still, if you've seen the video, this implies that, for a not insignificant number of students, their understanding is that an augmented sixth chord is just any time a dominant seventh resolves down a half step to the five, regardless of musical, historical, or stylistic context. So sure, in serious theory circles, there are important distinctions, but I'm not proposing this change in order to get rid of those distinctions. I like those distinctions, I'm proposing it in order to preserve them. If we agree that they matter, we should care whether or not people remember them, and I'm not convinced that pretending the two are completely unrelated is the best way to accomplish that. Maybe I overstepped when I said we should teach augmented six as a subset of tritone substitutions, but at the very least we should be mentioning the connection. Teach the difference, sure, but maybe we could treat them as like two separate examples of one larger phenomenon. Call it polar dominance or something, I don't care what name we use, but the current system makes it look like we're more concerned with labels than music, and I for one don't want to believe that's true. This all goes to show the value of perspective. When you're learning anything, it's always important to check out different explanations to see which approach works for you, and Skillshare is a great way to do that. Like, they have an awesome class on mixing songs from Grammy-nominated audio engineer Young Guru. He's worked with some of the biggest names in modern music, including Jay-Z, Beyonce, and Eminem, and his class is full of really good advice for anyone looking to improve their mixing skills. But the best part is that Skillshare has a bunch of other classes on the same topic, including one by producer and DJ King Arthur. It's also really insightful, but because he's coming at it from a different angle, he winds up focusing on different parts of the problem, so going through both classes helps you understand the art of mixing more fully than any one teacher could provide on their own. Getting different perspectives allows you to find the approach that works best for you, and since Skillshare offers tens of thousands of classes in music production, songwriting, cooking, art, and more, it's easy to get dozens of different takes on anything you might want to learn about. And to get you started, Skillshare's even offering 12 Tone viewers two months of free premium membership with full access to their entire library. All you have to do is click the link in the description, and if you like it, sticking around is super affordable, with premium plans starting under 10 bucks a month. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to this video's featured patron, Susan Jones. If you want to help out and get some sweet perks like sneak peeks of upcoming episodes, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.